Good morning. My name is Greg Hoadley, and I'm the pastor of Redeemer Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Airdrie, Alberta. I'd like to welcome you to our worship service for March 29th, 2020. And we're so glad that our members and regular attenders could be here worshiping with us. As you can see, we are back in the SDA church building, and so we hope that's encouraging for all of you. And I want to say that if there are any guests watching, we just want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're so glad to have you with us, and we pray that this time would be a great blessing for you. And I just remind you that this is new for all of us. So I would ask you to please bear with us, and we do thank you for your continued prayers and encouragement for us. We, were, we are gonna remain in contact with our members and regular attenders about worship coming up in the future. But for now, I'd like us to take a moment and quiet our hearts as we prepare to meet with our Lord in holy worship. Would you rise for the call to worship? Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We are gathered together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. From where does your help come? Our help comes from the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I greet you this morning in his name. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to ask, would you pray with me? O oh God of all grace, you who looked upon us with love and predestined us for salvation from eternity past, you who love us with an everlasting love, we gather here now this morning to worship you. Even as we are apart from one another, we rejoice that we are together in spirit. And we are so thankful for this technology that even while we cannot be together, we can worship you in our own homes, even as a body. We ask that you would bless us during this time on your holy day in our worship of you. And we pray that you would help us to see Christ in all of his splendor and glory and beauty and help us to long even more for that day of his return. And may what we do now be a taste of that glorious eternity that awaits us. All of this we ask and pray in his name, that name above all names. Amen. Now, congregation of our Lord, I would like to ask that you confess your faith with me as we read together the Apostles' Creed found on the back of your handout. I'd like to ask you this morning, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Now, this portion of the worship service, we have the call to confession, the reading of God's law, this morning found in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. This is the first commandment. God's word says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. What this commandment does is it teaches us to have a healthy fear of God means to have a mentality that seeks to please him in all things. Not just attending worship when we're able to, but also in how we treat our spouses, our parents, our children, and also our attitudes at work, remembering that no matter what we do, we are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. When we don't do these things, we have violated this commandment. And so it would be good for us now to bow our heads and confess our sins to our God. Would you join with me in prayer? Our holy and righteous and just God, we have indeed been confronted with your law, and it cuts us to the heart because we know that we have broken it in so many ways. And in doing so, O oh Father, we have not loved you as we ought. We have trusted in ourselves rather than in you. And for that, dear Lord, we are truly sorry. We need you that we'd he you would hear us as we pray to you, as we confess our sins, and as we desire to be right with you. But we recognize as well that this is only possible through the merits of Jesus Christ. It's in him that we trust, and so we plead that you will see him in us, and that your Holy Spirit would continue his work of sanctification in us. Please deliver us as well from any sense at all of self-righteousness, and help us to lean only upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ, our rock and our salvation. It is in his name that we pray these things. Amen. Having confessed our sins to God, hear now the passage of gospel comfort to you. This morning, found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. God's word says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Beloved, that promise is yours. As you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved by grace through faith and not works. And to that we can give a hearty amen. Now our passage of gospel fruit, or how we would live as a result of this grace through faith that we receive through Christ, is found in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Let us hear again God's word. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden in, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Amen. And now is the time in our worship when we would take the offering. Now, as you know, we can't do that right now, but just as a reminder, the work of the church does continue. So if you haven't done so already, please give by e-transfer through ropctreasurer at gmail.com. And this week, the special offering is for Grace Finder, the ministry of our good friend, Brian Clark in Edmonton. As a reminder, if you don't designate your gifts, they automatically go to the general fund. And once again, please send your gifts to ropctreasurer at gmail.com.
congregation of our Lord, would you join with me in prayer once again? Let us all pray together. O oh God, you who are our hiding place and our refuge and our source of strength, we delight to come before you in prayer now. And we pray in light of what has happened in recent events, that whatever might befall us in this life, that we need not be afraid for you are our shelter and you are our fortress which shall never be removed. And as our great refuge, we know that we can come before you in prayer. And so we lift up to you this morning our congregation, Redeemer OPC. Again, we are saddened that we cannot be together in person, but we rejoice in that we still are together in spirit, and we long for that day when we can gather together again at this place in holy worship of you, and we can more fully enjoy the communion of the saints. Oh, we look forward to that day, dear God. And Lord, we do pray that you would indeed bless our offering this morning, that you would use it for your glory above and beyond what we might ask or even imagine. We also lift up this morning the news, the wonderful news that Ainsley Korsholm is expecting. We are so delighted to hear that and we pray for her. We pray that you would indeed be with her these next several months. We pray for her as well as for Ariana Van Holst and also Stephanie Edgington as they are also expecting Lord, we look forward to the day when we see those children running around in here and bringing us great joy as covenant children here. And so we lift them up to you. Father, we also lift up Jennifer Shinshik's father as he has had some minor strokes and he is 95 years old following his knee surgery. Lord, we ask that you would please give him peace and that you would give him calm. And Lord, we pray that you would please reach out to him so that he may indeed fully and truly and unreservedly lean upon you, O oh God. And Lord, at this time, we know that many people are struggling because this time is very hard. We lift all of them up to you even now. We pray for those who need work. Many here have had their hours cut back and others have no work at all. We ask you for your kind hand of provision upon them. We also pray for our parents as they looked after their children during these difficult times. Please keep watch over the children as well. Please be kind to all of them during this very difficult providence. We are also thankful for our governmental leaders as they have led us through the COVID-19 crisis thus far. We lift up to you in that regard, Prime Minister Trudeau, Premier Kenny, and also Dr. Dina Hinshaw, the Chief Medical Officer of Health for Alberta. We lift them up as they do have to make many difficult decisions. We pray that the decisions they make would be wise, that they would be charitable, and they would look out for our safety. So please help them in that, dear God. We also lift up to you once again our doctors and our nurses who have so faithfully served, who have so faithfully put themselves in harm's way so that they could care for others who are in desperate need of it now with the coronavirus. At this time, we also lift up to you our officers of this church, our elders and deacons, thanking you for all that they do for us and all that they continue to do. We also pray for pastors and for elders and for church planters as they are especially challenged right now. Please help them all as they learn how to best minister to the congregations that you have put them under during this very challenging time. And in that regard, dear Father, we pray that you would bless us as we continue in our worship of you. May all those who are hearing all those who are listening, be with us in spirit and in truth. And Lord, may we indeed long to hear from your word as it is about to be proclaimed to us. Lord, be with us by your Holy Spirit. Draw us closer unto you. And may we indeed, above all, see Jesus Christ. All of this we ask and pray in his most holy and wondrous name. Amen. Now I'd like to ask that we please turn in our copy of the scriptures to Psalm 46, Psalm 46. This will be our sermon text for this morning, Psalm 46. Let us hear now from the inspired word of the living God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. 
There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. He, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Thus ends this reading from God's word. May he add his blessing to it. Let us pray once again. O Holy Spirit, would you indeed be with us now as your word is open and it is about to be preached. We ask that it would indeed minister to our hearts and minds and make Christ very real to us as we know that he is our Savior and the only name by which men may be saved. In his name we pray and ask. Amen. One of the wonderful things about the Psalms is that they speak to so many different types of situations and also so many of the emotions that we have to go through. There are Psalms of lament, where the author cries out to God over whatever's on his heart. There are also Psalms that proclaim joy and victory. And of course, there are also Psalms of history and prophecy. But then we come to Psalms like Psalm 46. This is what we might call a Psalm of hope. Now, a Psalm like this is absolutely critical for us as believers because what they do is they cause us to take our eyes off of all the troubling things in the world around us and look up to God, who is our one sure hope. And it reminds us that he is the author of human history and that he has a glorious ending in mind for us. And that even when it seems like he's silent in the midst of our trials, this psalm reminds us that he's still there. He hasn't gone anywhere. And it's only going to be a matter of time before he rises up and does something about the current crisis. All of that to say, Psalm 46 reminds us of a very special truth. That God is our fortress in times of trouble. And that we can flee to him when we need him the most. And he will be there for us. It also reminds us that God towers high above those things that life that trouble us so much, whether they be darkness or uncertainty or watching a friend have to suffer or ourselves being without work. And yes, even a pandemic like this one that we're dealing with right now. And this is a Psalm that believers have very often turned to in dark times. Whenever he feared for his life, Martin Luther would say to his young associate, Philip Melanchthon, he would say, come Philip, let us sing the 46th and let the devil do his worst. And in fact, Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, is based upon this psalm. And throughout the ages, many ministers have preached on this psalm during times of trouble. So today we're gonna see why the psalm is so worth turning to at a time like this. We'll see how it can calm our hearts and help us to look up to God in faith during this difficult time and be reminded that he is there. And as Robert Godfrey notes, this psalm was very likely inspired by an historical event. It's recorded for us in the Bible. Late in Israel's history, Sennacherib, who was the wicked king of Assyria, invaded Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. Now, by now, of course, the northern kingdom had ceased to exist. But Judah was very weak at this point, and Assyria had an army of 185,000 men outside of Jerusalem's gates. And so God's people were literally facing extinction. And it was so bad, it's recorded in 2 Kings 18, that Sennacherib came out, out from his army and he openly mocked God's people. That is how certain he was that he was going to be victorious that day. But when Hezekiah, the king of Judah, heard these taunts, he did what any believer would do in that predicament. He got down in his knees and he prayed. And he asked God to deliver them from defeat. And that's just what God did. 
God sent a single angel and that angel entirely wiped out the Assyrian army. Again, 185,000 soldiers. Now we know God doesn't always answer a prayer like that, but he certainly did here. And so this psalm was very likely written in response to that event. And that would make sense. When they were about to be demolished, the king sought out God and he threw himself at God's mercy. And in response, God faithfully delivered them. So you can only imagine their reaction. They praised God for what he'd done because they were reminded, as Psalm 46 tells us, that he is our refuge and our strength. Now, the Hebrew word for refuge refers to a place where you can find safety in the midst of trouble. And strength refers to God himself, as he's often referred to in the Old Testament. And in verses 2 and 3, the writer says that we will not fear, even though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea and the roaring waters foam. And that's a reminder of something so obvious. We rarely even think about it. In life, there's one thing, there's one thing that you and I actually trust in more than just about anything else. Do you know what that is? It's the ground we walk on. You and I take for granted that the ground we walk on is going to remain stable and it's not going to crumble beneath us. But have you ever been through an earthquake? It's a very unsettling thing to do because that which you instinctively trust, again, the ground you walk on shakes and crumbles right beneath you. You have absolutely no warning. One moment, everything's just fine, but then the ground you're walking on starts to shake. and In the worst of cases, it even separates under your feet. And this is precisely the sort of thing that the psalmist is describing in verses 2 and 3. This is a scene of absolute chaos, where you can't even rely upon the ground you walk upon. And this unsure footing could also describe many other difficult times in life. Certainly describes something of what we're dealing with right now. A dangerous virus has hurt a lot of people. It's altered our lives. Not only uh, were, were some people's plans changed very drastically, but many others have had their work hours cut back. And for others, there's no work at all. And perhaps the hardest part about it is that this is so unprecedented, at least in our own lifetimes. And not only that, we simply don't know how long this is going to last. But notice what the psalmist says in response. He says, we will not fear. Even if the earth splits open, even if the mountains collapse into the sea, God will remain a refuge for his people. That's what God's word promises you and me, that he will continue to provide a refuge for us. And for that reason, beloved, we don't need to be afraid. But before we move on, I do want to point out a few practical applications of this. First, we see that little phrase, we will not fear. And that should encourage us because it reminds us that God is still there and he will take care of us. But there's something else it does. What it does is it sets apart believers from unbelievers. Now, here's where I'm going with this. Everyone in the world is being affected by our current situation. And it makes no difference at all whether they believe in Jesus Christ or if they don't. But you have something as a believer that an unbeliever does not have. You have hope in God who, verse 1, is our refuge and strength and a very present help in time of trouble. And as you think back on your own lives, I'm sure you can remember those times when God delivered you out of a very stressful, very hard ordeal, that he calmed your fears when you were scared. Maybe he saved your business when you poured so much of yourself into it and he kept it from collapsing against all odds. Or perhaps when he answered your prayers by changing the heart of a loved one who'd been rebelling against him and possibly against you for a long period of time. Whatever instance you're thinking of, when you think back on that moment in your life, you are reminded that you can say here with the psalmist, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. But in contrast to that, what does an unbeliever have to hold on to during a time like this? Not much. All he or she can do is just 
hope for the best. Hope that things will generally turn out okay, that this is going to pass by, and then they're not going to be affected by things too badly. And once it passes, they can simply go back to placing their trust and their security and their contentment in earthly things. So let me just say to you here, what an opportunity this current circumstance brings to us. What an opportunity for us to tell them about our great God, who's our refuge and our strength about how he's always there for us in times of trouble. So think for a moment of the unbelievers in your life right now. Think of who they might be. Remember that they don't have this sure hope in God that you and I do. So pray for them. And if the opportunity presents itself, listen to their fears, empathize with them, and then tell them about this great God who's always been there for you. And because of that, your confidence is in him and that he will be there for you during this crisis and he will see you through it. And for anybody watching this morning who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, you've let all this talk about God roll off your back probably for a very long time. I'd just like to plead with you. It's not too late. If one of your Christian friends or family members reaches out to you, please don't be afraid to talk to them. Come to them with your honest questions. Tell them why you're doubting and think about what's holding you back. And then I plead to you, listen to what they have to say. Ask them what difference Christ has made in their own lives. Hear them out. You'll be glad you did. But that's the first thing I wanna say. Christian, please pray for and look for opportunities to speak to those who don't know Christ your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, and your coworkers. Now, the second point is this. Even though you and I have God, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna have fears in this lifetime. We need to be honest with ourselves. Sometimes even the strongest and most sanctified of Christian believers get scared. But sadly, when many Christians hear this passage that says, we will not fear, Unfortunately, they draw the wrong conclusion that if they are fearing Phil for a while, well, then they're just not trusting God. And so they put on a show in front of others that they're confident and that they've got everything under control when they really don't. Now, if that describes you, remember for a moment what I said earlier about the Psalms. There's a certain kind of Psalm that I started with. It's called a Psalm of Lament. This is where the person praying they're at their wit's end They've had one difficult providence after another, and they just don't think that they can take another one. But then another crisis hits. And it's at that point that they cry out, as we see so often in the Psalms, that phrase, how long, O Lord? That's even true of King David, a man who was so courageous and he had such a strong faith in God. Even he cried out to God like this in very, very often in the Psalms. And if a man like King David needed to cry this out to God, how much more do you and I? How long, O oh Lord? That is a genuine cry of anguish. And you as a believer have both a right and a privilege to cry that out to God when you need to, especially now when we don't know how long this pandemic is going to affect us in terms of our work, our school, our church life, and even something as simple as getting together with friends and families. In fact, God longs for you to cry out to him when you need him the most. And when you do, one of the things he'll do is that he is going to remind you of how he's helped you through previous crises in your life. And it reminds us that even though the current situation may not be over, how and when we'd like it and how we'd prefer it to be over, you know that God is there. You know that he has not moved. He will never abandon you. And in his perfect time, he will take care of things. And when you remember all of this, that can only put your mind at ease because it will remind you of a very basic truth that believers forget all too often. And that truth is this, that God is in control and you and I are not. That's actually a very comforting reality because if it were up to us, it would be a huge mess. 
But when you remember that God is in control, you remember to take the burden off of yourself and put it onto the Lord, and you can rest assured that he will take care of things. And one practical result of this is it gives us a sense of peace, knowing that God is in control. And that's the picture we see in the second stanza, starting in verse four. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. There's just something calming about a river, isn't there? It just takes us back to nature, back to God's creation. And all throughout the Bible, a river is a metaphor for blessing and refreshment and restoration. A river also signifies God's presence with his people. And by the way, notice the, what contrast the river in verse 4 is to the raging waters in verse 3. But notice what a river signifies in the Bible. As far back as Genesis chapter 2, in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve had very close and intimate fellowship with God, four rivers flowed through that garden. And then listen to these words in Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Now, just as in Genesis and Revelation, we see also here in Psalm 46 that the river passes through God's city. It's a picture of serenity. As it says in verse 4, this river's streams make glad the city of God. As we see in Genesis and Revelation, it's a sign of God's presence with us. The fact that God is right there with you. Sometimes, really, that's all we need to remember. Sometimes it just helps to remember that God is there. Just like a young child is reassured because he or she knows that one of their parents or a guardian is nearby, so it is for us with God. And God doesn't even have to say anything, let alone do something dramatic to make his presence known to you. Just knowing that he is there and remembering that he is a very present help in times of trouble is something that we all need to help us through a troubling period of time. And this is how God helps us and how he calms our fears during times of trouble. You and I as believers can experience this calmness even when, verse 6, the nations rage and kingdoms totter. Yes, even when God's people are under attack, even when we're dealing with so much stress and uncertainty, you can know that God knows about it and that he will vindicate you as you remain faithful to him. In fact, notice what God does in verse 6. It says he utters his voice and the earth melts. In other words, the trial you're dealing with might be, look so big and so insurmountable. You think there's no way that you're ever going to get through it. Notice what God does. All he does is speak, and his enemies are wiped out. Beloved, that is how powerful our God is. So whenever you get discouraged by any, any number of things, remember that all God has to do is speak, and they will be demolished. Now, yes, these trials we go through, they're very upsetting to us. But remember, our God is far greater. He is our confidence, and he is there with us whenever we need him. Whenever you read the scriptures, you see this confidence in the Lord over and over again in God's people. We see it in Abraham, who left behind his people and the only life he'd ever known to travel far away to the land that, that God had promised him because he had faith in God. You see it in Joseph, when he stood strong in his faith, even when his brothers sold him into slavery, and then he was tempted by Potiphar's wife. You see it in Elijah, when he courageously faced hundreds of Baal's prophets alone on Mount Carmel. You see it in that young shepherd boy, David, when he was not scared at all by Goliath, who was a giant of a man, and yet David defeated him with a simple slingshot. And you see this even among great Christians today who risk getting arrested or persecuted or even martyred simply by doing what Christians are supposed to be doing, namely worshiping God publicly and telling others about him. 
And this kind of disposition can only come when we have the confidence that God is with us, even when circumstances seem to indicate otherwise. And this takes us directly into the final stanza, verses 8 to 11, where the psalmist gives you one last picture, and that's God's final victory over his and our enemies. Now with that in mind, verse 8 invites us to do something special, to look at the works of the Lord. And this actually dovetails with what I mentioned earlier about how remembering what God has done for you during life's harder trials can help you during the trials that come into your life. So often when we're in the middle of one, we can very easily lose our biblical perspective. We forget to look at God and we make the mistake of only focusing on your current hardship. And we know what this does. It leads to fear and panic. And it leads us to making rash decisions without first praying about it, which only makes matters worse. But here, God's word is reminding us to look at the works of the Lord, to remember what he has done in the past, and to have the firm confidence that he will act again as he's done so often in the past. For instance, do you, you remember when God, through Moses, led the people out of Egypt? He led them straight to the Red Sea while they were being chased by Pharaoh's mighty army. They all thought they were going to die. But what did God do? He parted the sea, and the people went safely across to the other side. But when Pharaoh's army tried to cross, all of a sudden the seawater suddenly came together again, and that entire army was wiped out. And that's just a picture of what's being spoken about there in verses 8 through 11. It's calling us to remember what God has done in the past and to remember that this same God is right there with us even now. And we see this especially in verse 10, which begins with that wonderful saying, Be still and know that I am God. It's such a simple statement, but it's also one that's very deep and meaningful. When you're dealing with something unbearable and you're ready to give up all hope, it's when you remember to be still and know that he is God that you can rest assured that he is there and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. He will take care of you in his own time, in his own way, and far better than you or I ever could. Be still and know that I am God. Perhaps that's God's word for somebody right now. Who's listening to this. We usually look at that as a word of comfort. It certainly is. But we need to realize it's far more than just that. This actually is the lead in to God's statement of victory over his enemies. And we see that in the rest of verse 10. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And he's saying to his and our enemies, I will prevail, I will defeat you, and I will never abandon my own. So verse 10 is God Almighty's declaration of victory over his and our enemies. And don't forget, for us as Christians, that victory already happened. Our victory already took place when Christ was resurrected from the dead, which signifies that he had conquered our two greatest enemies, sin and sin and death. And because of that, we can say with the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? And this is what, what you and I need to hold on to. God would not deny us his own beloved son, and that being the case, how could he not see us through this crisis? How will he not also be there for you when you need to cry out to him? Beloved, never forget that you remain in his grasp. He will never lose you, and nothing will ever snatch you out of his hand. You can trust in him, and you can wait upon the Lord in his perfect timing. You can be still and know that he is God, and you can know that he will guide us through this. And when he does, we'll then be able to rejoice, because we'll then see that once again, he was true to his words. He is our Lord who told us, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, and I will never leave you or forsake you. This is our God who keeps all of his promises. Would you join with me in prayer? Oh, 
O oh God, you who are our comfort, our shelter, our strength and our refuge, how we thank you for your word to us this morning from the Psalms. Thank you for reminding us of your promises that you provide not merely salvation, but also safety and security and sanctification in this lifetime. You preserve us and you protect us and you sanctify us and you enable us to persevere unto the end till you come again. Help us to remember this, O Christ. Help us to trust in this. And that as we do so, that you would free us from any boasting of self and that Christ indeed would be our only boast. For Christ, you are so good to us beyond measure. We are so thankful that you provide for us in so many ways. May we never forget these things, and may we long for the day when you return to set all things right. This we pray in your most wonderful and holy and glorious name. Amen. And now would you rise with me once again as we sing the Gloria Patri. receive the benediction of our God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.